Coming up on Time for Hope. I meet a lot of women who are complaining that their husbands don't even understand their bodies. They don't understand really how sex is supposed to work. And they really don't care about the woman having uh, sexual fulfillment. Join Dr. Frida Cruz, licensed professional counselor, and her guests as they provide practical solutions to real life problems on Time for Hope. We appreciate you joining us on Time for Hope, a faith-based mental health program. And this is our second week's discussion with author, international speaker, and former editor and current contributing editor of Charisma Magazine, Lee Grady. Lee's book we are discussing is titled, 10 Lies Men Believe, and subtitled, The Truth About Women, Power, Sex, and God, and Why It Matters. In this book, Lee attempts to teach men how to create a life based on God's definition of manhood. He asserts, we must admit that muscles, money, and multiple sex partners don't qualify us us for true manhood. It must go deeper than that, since these are the world's standards and not God's. He further relates that if God made you a man, then it is only God who can give you total fulfillment in that identity. To learn more, stay with us. And Lee, you did real good sitting there uh, for our second week's discussion <laughs> of your book. So uh, I have something I want to spring on you. Okay, go okay? ahead. Okay, the letter I read as I went out on last week, uh, the woman uh, living with a man, uh, and he's been unfaithful. She says more than 20 times. They've only separated, she said, three to four times, and that he suffers from sexual and alcohol addiction, but that she has remained faithful to God's calling to stay in the marriage. Now, I suggested that she get professional help. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, let's say she turned to you. What would be your advice to this woman? Well, first of all, I would... I would uh, give her congratulations for enduring that kind of pain because, I mean, I, I don't know how she did that all those years. Uh, she does need professional counseling, but I, I guess I would want to go back and find out why this man did not get some help earlier. You know, was, was he refusing to get some help? Was she... Uh, pointing Enabling him, him by not requiring him to get some help? Pointing him to some place, yes, and demanding that and, you know, getting some other people involved to intervene. That man needed an intervention a long time ago, you know, and so I, I don't know uh, if it had to be that long of a process. It seems like after the first violation, uh, she could have put her foot down and said, you either go get some help or I'm moving out uh, until I'm convinced that you're changing your attitude. Two things. Uh, Norm Wright does a lot of writing, as you know, on marriage, and uh, a, a, a colleague and friend of mine. And he, has, he puts out the idea that sometimes it's absolutely necessary to create a crisis in a marriage, mm. uh, which, uh, of course, I, I agree with that. And, and uh, then we, we think of the verse that our bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit. So it doesn't allow for uh, abuse, for the abuse of a woman. And certainly it doesn't allow for her taking him back time and again when he's been with another woman. Absolutely. And that's what I always go back with women. And they tell me their husbands are being unfaithful. And I'm saying, well, have you been tested for a venereal disease because your husband is likely, he could bringing, be sick. He could be bringing one to her. Exactly. Or and more that's, than one. That, that shows me that that woman has a very low opinion of herself that she would even submit to that because she could be putting her own life in danger. Yes. And the life of her children if she has them because what's going to happen to her if she gets sick because of her husband's sin? You know, I guess what was really interesting, and I'm not, I, in no way is, uh, am, are we putting this woman down. We are saying that she probably has had poor role modeling or she's been given wrong advice mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so forth that has kept her in this marriage without 
creating a crisis, uh, as it were, because she says, I have remained faithful to God's calling to stay in the marriage. Then she's believing a lie. And who told her the lie? Mm -hmm. That she was supposed to stay in the marriage if changes, uh, you know, are not, are, are not coming. Exactly. And I've seen that many, many times, Frida, that churches, we, we, because of course, we, we don't want divorce. We don't, we don't want to encourage divorce. But as you said, this the problem was already going on in this marriage, and it was it, it's a it's been a storm for 20 years, and so that woman has to take some action, uh, you know, serious action, to and if that marriage has to end because of the unfaithfulness, you know, it, for her own betterment, she's going to have to get out of that situation, get out from under that man's uh, oppression, really, because of the way he's treating her. For freedom, she might just have to exit the marriage forever. Then there's also the the possibility that not putting up with it any longer could change this man's life. Uh, that he, you know, he could be brought under conviction and repent and uh, right. uh, change his ways. And that's why we we need the activity of the Holy Spirit in our lives because, you know, we can follow what we believe are rules or what we believe are principles, but ultimately we need to, the Lord to show us what does He want us to do in a situation like that. Then you've got your, um, the number five lie, and I want you to do most of the talking on this. Sex is primarily for the man's enjoyment, not the woman's. That's as far from the scriptures as it can get, isn't it? Right, well I always take people back to 1 Corinthians chapter seven where Paul the Apostle was teaching on marriage, and he said something very radical for his day. He said that in, the, in a Christian marriage, the man has authority over his wife's body and the woman has authority over her husband's body. That's talking about what we call mutuality, which is not a concept that a lot of Christians understand. A lot of Christian men don't understand that because they've been taught, well, I'm the man, I'm in charge. And so they think, well, whenever I come home and I've had a a rough day and you know I can just sort of bark at my wife and complain about the dinner and go sit in my easy chair and then at 10 o'clock I'm ready to hop in bed and get my sexual needs met and that is not going to work. A woman has to be loved, she has to be cared for tenderly and love making does not start in the bedroom, it starts in the beginning of the day when we greet our wives and we treat them with respect and we offer encouragement and we offer tenderness all throughout the day and we are even willing to maybe serve our wives or help them with the dishes or whatever, that is all, that's part of mutuality. And so, but I meet so many Christian guys who have that attitude and I meet a lot of women who are complaining that their husbands don't even understand their bodies, they don't understand really how sex is supposed to work, and they really don't care about the woman having a sexual fulfillment. They just want to jump in, in bed and basically get, get it over with, get their needs met, and have no concern for the woman. And uh, this is a very, very common scenario in a lot of marriages. Isn't there a scripture that says something about uh, if a man doesn't, uh, oh, he, he is to live with his wife according to knowledge, lest his prayers go hindered. hindered. First yes. Peter 3, verse 7. Yes. I use that verse a lot in, in the, with the issue of domestic violence because Peter said, as he's teaching on marriage, if you don't treat your wife as a co-heir of the grace of life, which means treating her as an equal, treating her with the same respect that you want, offering that to her, it says that sh your prayers will be hindered. In other words, your relationship with God can be disrupted Just, or cut off because of the way you treat your wife. If you're hitting her, if you're yelling and screaming at her, if you're looking down on her as if she's an inferior, that can affect your relationship with God. When we think of all of what you're saying, Lee, we come down to mutual submission. <laughs> and I Which like is to a term that, that a lot way. of Christians Ooh, don't they hear. Don't want, they don't hear it, and a lot of, a lot of them don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear that. But uh, I like it when uh, the scripture says that Abraham obeyed Sarah. He listened to his <laughs> wife. That's what some versions say. Yeah, yeah. Then, when men believe these lies. Um, 
and it's not difficult. It wouldn't be difficult for a man to believe any of these lies, actually. It'd be easier to believe them than... It's the prevailing attitude. Uh, yeah. But uh, when they do, is there a strong possibility that their fathers have been poor role models and then you've, you've taken up the whole issue also of healing uh, the father wounds, wherein the fathers have not been good role models, but they've also, they have also not affirmed the men. So mm -hmm. that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, they're finding affirmation in other ways. Wouldn't exactly. you agree with that? I devoted a whole chapter to the whole, the lie that a that a, a man can't be close to his father because this is such a fundamental issue for so many men. I've counseled with so many guys and I spend a lot of time now mentoring and discipling younger guys and I have found that in our culture today in America, fatherlessness of course is a huge problem but even guys who maybe had fathers in the home, living physically in the home, we have the issue of say what we call a distant father a father who's home but he's really not home. He's not emotionally engaged with his wife or his kids. And a lot of men today, their fathers never told them, I love you. They were never affectionate with them. They never offered a fatherly hug to them. And so they, they are, they, they're struggling inside with a huge gap. Uh, then we have guys maybe whose fathers were abusive Sexually, I had that show up in counseling, and you think in school that you learn every, everything that you're going to be confronted with, and that's a myth, of course, mm -hmm. uh, and you think, well, I finally have heard it all or whatever, and then something new pops in pops up and that was new for me mm -hmm. uh, because of my rearing and my heritage which that right. that was so we far. We never heard of things we like that. We never heard of Today, things like that but men, yeah. fathers sexually abusing their sons. Mm -hmm. Actually that's the beginning very often of their homosexuality. Right and then there's also uh, guys who maybe their, hus their uh, fathers were alcoholics and this can create uh, huge problems for a, a man to be able to trust, you know, because, and that what happens is, Frida, I believe that, you know, God is our Heavenly Father. But when we talk about fathers to people today, and we talk about God being your father, for a lot of people that's uncomfortable because they've had such poor role models as dads. And so what we have to help people understand and what I have, I'm trying to attempt to do with this book is to help men understand that your Heavenly Father isn't like the Father that you know. Maybe they don't even know their Father. They may not even know where He is. And so they, they can really struggle to know a God who calls Himself Father and yet He never even came to visit them one time. You know, and so we have to teach them that the love of the Heavenly Father transcends all of that and that no matter what kind of earthly father you had, the, your Heavenly Father will come and He will fill in all those gaps that you have in your life no matter what. And a man can be completely transformed, I believe, by the love of the Heavenly Father. I agree with you on that and also I think the church could feel a very real uh, place uh, and even avoid with this by role models being in the church that a man uh, that a man that didn't have a proper role model can attach themselves to and uh, as it were a surrogate father mm -hmm. and be transformed even through an experience like that. Mm -hmm. so, well it's time for a break and we will be right back. I always find it amusing when science discovers a truth that is already recorded in the Bible. Author Joffrey Cowley related, science is revealing the biological roots of men's persistent one-upmanship. And he further relates, scientists are now discovering status-seeking is not just a habit or a cultural tradition. It's a design feature of the male psyche, a biological drive that is rooted in the nervous system and regulated by hormones and brain chemicals. In other words, men did not learn to be the way they are. They were wired and put together with specific chemicals and hormones that makes them like they are. 
We read in Genesis, the first chapter in verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Do men only crave status? Callie admits, males are not the only ones who crave status, but we pursue it more doggedly than females at every stage of life. According to Harvard anthropologist Richard Rangham, the hormone testosterone is responsible for this. He goes on to explain that the testosterone level peaks during a contest. There was a time this served the purpose of males being responsible to kill for supper and fight off the wild animals that tried to devour their families. Now that such aggression is not generally needed, men have to redirect their desire and power and control. An example being climbing the corporate ladder. Some misguided spiritual leaders teach that men have an inherent right to rule over their wives and children with an iron rod. Other men direct their aggression towards women by abusing them physically. I like the bumper sticker that says, real men don't hit women. Instead of seeking to be real men through success, power, and lording it over their wives, real men can prove their upmanship by seeking to please their creator. And the directions for doing so are found in his word. God's word will direct men to become leaders of their homes and spiritual role models for their wives and children. Instead of abusing their wives, they will seek to honor them by seeking to meet their emotional and sexual needs. Men, if you wish to know truth and stop believing the lies that our guest has been discussing, get into God's Word and become a man of prayer, and you will soon develop a desire to humble yourselves before the Lord so that you can become like Him as He originally created you to be. Thanks for staying with us on Time for Hope. We're talking with Lee Grady for the second week and discussing his book, Ten Lies Men Believe. And Lee, you mentioned that some men don't believe they need close male relationships. And one of the reasons for that is they are afraid they will be tagged uh, as a homosexual or gay. Mm. Am I correct in that? If, they, if they're seen a lot hanging out with just men? Well, I think most in our culture, uh, particularly the older generation today, Men just never really learned how to be open with each other. They thought that vulnerability and you know being able to talk about your feelings or being open about your personal life was somehow a sign of weakness. And I think we created this mystique that a real man, you know, is sort of the Marlboro man of advertising. He's the rugged guy who's just so strong and very lonely, but that's some kind of a, a good quality, you know. And actually that's very unhealthy. You know, God created men with, uh, with a need to be able to uh, be open and transparent. And actually, we're not healthy people if we are not transparent about our lives. And a lot of men, the reason why they don't have relationships and they're very lonely is because they carry a lot of shame and a lot of guilt about their mistakes and they don't know how to get that out. And so I teach guys that you're going to have to sit down with some close friends or at least one close friend and be willing to spill your guts and get your all your dirty laundry out there so that you can be healed because the Bible says that you uh, if we confess our sins to one another we will be healed. Well you're thinking more in terms of accountability groups maybe which are springing up which I think is very healthy uh, for men uh, and within th those groups, they, they have the opportunity, as you say, to spill their guts and mm -hmm. put them out and knowing that the other men are going to be praying for them and uh, that uh, what they put out is kept within the group, the Absolutely. confidentiality. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, I, I, that would make for better homes, uh, better marriages, uh, mm -hmm. 
it, it, there's no, it's a no-win situation, isn't it? Because when men are... I mean, are, it is a win-win situation. Yes, win-win. And when men are stuffed with feelings and they're not letting them out, that becomes a powder keg. And, and it, God did not create us to stuff our emotions, you know. Uh, but a lot of men, they just do it for so long that they just become almost incapable of showing emotion. And there are women who are very frustrated today because their husbands can't be intimate with them because they're so shut down emotionally, they, they really can't even connect with their wives in an emotional way. Well, then that would go back to the, uh, the lie that you have that big boys don't cry. <laughs> uh, and I hope I, never, I hope I never told my son that. Uh, because I didn't believe that. In fact, I think it takes big men to cry. Absolutely. Uh, you agree and you with look me at on the that? scriptures, and I gave a lot of examples in scripture of men in the Bible who obviously didn't have that issue. They, they were strong men. They were, you know, even Esau in the Bible, who we think of as being a real macho guy, even he cries in the Bible. And of course, Jesus, who's our greatest model, he was very open with his feelings. And you know, even his when his best one of his closest friends Lazarus died, we see that scene of Jesus weeping. You know, so uh, I think that we need to get over that hang up. Is it true? And I have the impression that the Hebrews the uh, are more emotional. The men are uh, than the American men. Sure. And if you go to, I spend a lot of my time in other parts of the world, in developing world, some Middle Eastern cultures even Southern European cultures, also people are just more affectionate. You know, when you greet, uh, you go to, I hang out with my Puerto Rican friends or my Italian friends, and we might even just kiss each other on the cheek, and there's a lot of affection. But because of, I think, in American culture, maybe shaped by some Northern European influence, we had the idea that we have to be more stoic. And that's not healthy, because God's the one who gave us tear ducts, he gave us all these ways to release emotion, and I don't think it's healthy for us not to. I have a dear friend and colleague um, that is one of the most successful men I have ever known, one of the wealthiest men I have ever known, and yet I've seen him just weep uh, yeah. over something that, uh, you know, that I would probably weep uh, or cry over. And he, he felt free. Uh, mm -hmm among even groups to do that. Mm -hmm. And so it, uh, it doesn't have to do with your rank or your position or how much no. money you have. Uh, uh, and it doesn't mean you are weak. It doesn't no. mean you're not successful if, if you're able to cry uh, appropriately. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're not talking about being a crybaby. No. But a real man knows that true strength is also meek. And meekness is where you know how to temper your strength and that you know that compassion is a godly virtue. And many of our ministers of the past, the successful ministers like Robert Murray McShane and uh, even Charles Spurgeon, while preaching, mm -hmm. uh, they can begin to weep. Right. Uh, it was said of George Whitfield, the revivalist, yes, yes, that he would just cry through his whole sermon because he, he said, I feel the, the burden for these lost souls. He cared about them because he knew they were going to hell. Let's switch real quick as we go out, uh, Lee, and tell me as concisely as you can uh, your description of a real man. Well, first of all, I don't believe you can be a real man without knowing Jesus Christ personally. I like that. <laughs> we have not brought that out, so I'm thankful you're bringing that out. Because we're not going to really know who we are if we don't know our Creator. Oh, thank you for that. And then as Jesus comes into our lives and changes us, I believe a real man is strong, and I'm talking about strength of character and strength of uh, having the courage to step up and be uh, a man of God in the face of a wayward ungodly culture. Become a warrior, as you say in your book. Okay, right. what else? And then I believe that a true man is also uh, humble. You know, this is something we don't necessarily uh, put up on the, on, at the top of our list, but Jesus modeled that. And humble men are willing to be servants. Jesus said, if you want to be great, you become a servant. So that's a quality that I believe makes a true man. As Actually well as serving the wife. Uh, exactly. You break that out, especially servants of their wives. And being tender and compassionate yes. uh, influences in the world. 
in some ways you serve your children, don't you? Absolutely. Yeah, so we could go on and on, but you've done pretty good uh, wrapping it up. And thanks again so much for, for being here. And we'll be watching to see what books can come out next. Thank and, you, Frida, for having uh, me. It's wonderful having you back again, and Lord bless you and your ministry. And I have something as usual to share with you before uh, we go. Dear Dr. Frieda, I am separated from my wife after 45 years of marriage. We may have grown apart. I take the blame for everything. I was at fault. I love my wife very much. I don't have any contact because she has a restraining order against me. I have turned my wife over to God and he has touched my heart. Pray that he would touch hers also. What a wonderful letter to receive. A man that can say, it was my fault. Uh, uh, totally. My wife was not to blame. I've seen it. And it sounds like that he has either already repented or he's willing to repent of whatever he has done uh, that has wronged his wife or wounded his wife here. And he's praying for God to touch her heart so that this couple can be reconciled. And of course, when we get prayer requests, we try to honor what they're asking prayer for and the way they, but God, sometimes we can't. Uh, but this man seems submitted and surrendered to God's will, which uh, is a, a good sign that there's a possibility God has already intervened and hopefully also following up on our prayers for this situation. Again, I invite you to share your prayer requests with us, and I also encourage you to pray for us. Pray for Time for Hope, uh, for me, for our staff, and for the ministry and the vision that we have of offering hope to hopeless people, and sometimes not even totally hopeless, just seeking uh, to learn more about certain situations so that they can minister to others. That's another ministry of Time for Hope. People watch Time for Hope, they learn, and they go out and take that information in their own ministries. And then I again encourage you to join us as a team member financially. We are expanding. We're uh, being seen in many, many places these days with potentially millions watching Time for Hope each and every week. So I encourage you to join us in keeping this ministry going. We hope that today's Time for Hope program has been helpful and inspirational to you and your family. As a token of our appreciation for joining us, we would like to offer you a one-page fact sheet which contains additional information on today's topic. Log on to our website at timeforhope.org to view and print our fact sheet. Or you can call us at 1-800-669-9133 and we will send it to you free of charge. To get a copy of today's book for a suggested donation of 14 U.S. dollars or more, which includes shipping and handling, log on to our website at timeforhope.org. You may also call us at 1-800-669-9133, or you can write us at P.O. Box 2169, Spartanburg, South Carolina, 29304. Until next time, have a great week, and remember, it is time for hope.